and um, I will hand it over to you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for spending an hour of your Wednesday night with us. If you're here, it means that you're probably already an entrepreneur and business owner or hoping to be soon. And I know from experience that is a busy life. There's always work to be done. There's always more you feel like you can be doing for yourself. So to take an hour out of your week for yourself and to join us, we appreciate it. So feel free to get cozy. No need to turn on your camera if you don't want to. Grab a beverage, whatever you need. I'm going to take you through um, this really fun deck on how to create a cohesive brand strategy. I do have several pauses throughout the deck where we can ask questions, we can just take a breather. Um, and at any time, if I'm going too fast, you have questions, anything, please chat Kara and then or Africa, one of them will field everything to me, since I'll be looking at the deck. I will likely be facing this way. That's where my second screen is. So I promise I'm still looking towards you. Um, but please feel free to ask questions throughout each section as you think of them. And we'll also be doing a Q&A at the end. Okay, and with that, let's get started. So as Kara mentioned, hi, I'm Erica. Um, I am the founder, brand strategist, and artist at The Blank Canvas Company a Boston-based creative studio that creates custom art, brand design, and brand strategies, and statement pieces that empower your inner badass. So I know a few of you are probably joining who I've met um, from vendor events. As Kara mentioned, I do tons of pop-ups. Um, that's the primary, primary path that I sell my artwork. I also have an online shop too. Um, but outside of my art business, I am actually a marketer myself. So I'm a self-taught artist, but actually went to school for business marketing and communication. So I really try to figure out ways that I can pair the two together because doing a little bit of both always fills my cup. Um, but my marketing experience spans about 10 years of professional experience over many different industries. A few of my favorites were kitchen and home appliances, wedding planning, financial services, believe it or not, was actually super fun, um, and food and hospitality. Um, but really where my passion lies outside of just industry focuses and things that like I just enjoy doing is helping small women-owned businesses do their thing. I really get fired up just watching women win and watching them like own their power and do their thing and, you know, take a step away from corporate if they need to or have it and have their business in the form of a side hustle. Seeing that and being able to help and encourage that um, when I was at that stage in my business and I had people there for me, it meant the world. And so I want you guys to all know that outside of this and um, outside of just this presentation, I am always here if you want to shoot a DM. Um, and the same goes for Kara and Africa. I know they've been huge resources for me as I've grown my business over the past couple of years too. So fun stuff outside of work and professional stuff. When I'm not doing all of that, I do a lot of writing, um, both journaling, copywriting. Um, I love creating graphics and like doing anything with my hands that involves creativity. I'm also an avid runner. I'm currently training for a half marathon and love doing yoga. It's actually how Africa and I met. She was my yoga instructor. So always trying to keep myself balanced, keep myself healthy and all that really helps me to focus on keeping my head down and continuing to grow my business. So just some fun stuff. And not mentioned here is my Bernie's Mountain Dog puppy, who since we did this presentation last year has joined my life and he may or may not make an appearance because he likes to come uh, pitter pattering into my office. So you might see him at some point. Okay, let's get into it. So today we are talking about brand strategy creating a cohesive brand um, for your business. So I know many of you are probably in completely different stages of your business. Some of you may just be starting out. Some of you may have had your business going for a couple of years. But what I want to preface before we get into anything is that I hope you can take one or two things away from this, this presentation, this workshop for yourself whether that's looking at the exercises you've already done with a new perspective or learning a new path to market yourself or a new question to ask yourself. So even if you've been through these first couple stages we walked through, I still encourage you to keep that open mind and try to just see it through a different light. Okay, so brand strategy. I will say as a creative myself, 
when I think of branding, I always think of the visuals, the logos, the images, the colors, that's all of the fun stuff. But that is actually one of the latter steps in brand development. You really have to figure out who you are, what you stand for, what you're selling or who you're serving before you can envision what it actually looks like. You have to really have the bones and that's where we're going to start today. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and where you make that connection point between who I am and what I do and what I actually look like on my website, on my Instagram, et cetera. So I'm going to break it down into six main steps, your ideation, your identification of competitors and your audience defining your purpose or your reason to be, creating your visual identity, which is those logos and colors, the fun stuff, and then marketing your story and your brand. We'll end with a couple quick key takeaways, and then we'll have a, uh, the Q&A all the way at the end. But again, if you have questions throughout, please feel free to stop me. Okay, so the branding basics. I really define them as these six key steps. Each of these builds on, on one another. Ideation is really that brainstorm of where am I even starting? Where is marketing your story is? How am I actually going to show up for myself? How will I spread the word about this idea I have for my brand? So we're going to walk through each of these one by one, starting with ideation. <clears throat> so for each of these sections, I like to break it down into things to keep in mind and questions to ask yourself. So you'll start to see a theme as we go through each section. So your ideation, I think the most important thing that I can tell you today is that you are your brand. People buy you. People buy how they connect to you, how human you are. They think about how they connect to your products or the brands or the mission behind your company. That's what they are buying into, not just the colors and the beautiful logo. Those are additional things. So when you think about it, really think about that emotional reason for why you would purchase something. Money is an important thing to us. We don't just spend it to spend it, most of us, right? We really want to be purposeful about where we're putting our money. And that is always tied back to emotions and passions and purpose and interest and that connection point. So I love this quote by Simon, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, your reason behind why you do it. So your ideation, when you think about what you want to do with your business, it's really made up of three key components, your passions, your values, and your interests. And we'll go through each of these in a moment, but a few key questions to ask yourself, just truly just taking a moment to like look deep inside. What lights you up? What gets you super excited? What gets you out of bed? This doesn't have to be around a business idea, just in general as a human, like what makes you be like, I can't wait to do X, Y, Z. I want to go here. What is your purpose? What are you on this earth to do? What kind of emotions do you want to evoke in people, in your relationships, um, in your friendships, when you're meeting new people? What do you feel strongly about? Are you really passionate about politics? Do you feel strongly about women's rights? Think about those things that you read and that you see in the news and you're like, I want to take a stand on this. And what industries do you love? So for me, you know, I mentioned in the, in the beginning, I love fitness. I love hospitality. I love kitchen and home appliances. Like where are those things when you're scrolling through Instagram that you're looking at, that you're reading? What are, what are those industries or subsets? So going through each of these um, individually, I'm going to actually use an example from my own brand, how I kind of got to where I am. And then I'll also use an example from um, a more common brand that you guys have definitely heard of. Um, so starting with the Blank Canvas Co. So when I think about my passions, I'm personally super passionate about growing. Personally, growing others, um, empowering women specifically. Um, a lot of the reason behind that comes from personal experiences of not feeling empowered myself in a work environment. And once I really unlocked that in myself, I was like, you know, I really want to bring this to other people too. There have to be other people struggling with this. I'm also passionate about my creative habit, which is painting, drawing, um, creating. I love that. It lights me up when I think about it. I could sit and just look for inspiration all day and just being bold. Um, again, something I was not always good at, but something once I unlocked, I really felt like I needed it to be a part of my brand. 
my values, these are what you're really going to think of, of what you want to bring to the world, what's important to you in your community with your government. So community, kindness, positivity, equality, justice, courage, these words all come to mind for me when I think about what kind of contribution I want to make. <clears throat> and interests, these are the things again that the industries that I get really excited about that I wanna learn more about always and that I'd like to educate myself and others on. And using a more um, known example, iPhone, of course, we, know, we all know Apple and we all know iPhone. So for them, I, I actually simplified it even more. For them, their passions are innovation, creativity, and minimalism. These are the key components that will eventually go into their design, their mindset, how they market and talk to consumers. Their values are simplicity, helping others and collaborating with their community. And their interests really streamline the two, technology and design. So they created the Apple iPhone that brings that simplicity in this innovative techno technological product through collaboration, through working with other brands, through working with their community. All of these things really linked together to bring this innovative product that was show stopping on the market. There was nothing like this when this came out. If you remember, we had Blackberries, we had the NV3s, we had the swipe phone. There was nothing like this. And now look at all the copycat brands out there that have tried to pave the way of doing what they did, but doing it in a different way. That is the ultimate form of a reason to be for a brand, being the one to really steer the path on the industry. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick pause for questions. I'm gonna put myself on mute for a moment while we field them. But if you have anything that's come to mind through this first step, just let us know. Yeah, and again, if people don't want to um, open up their video or their audio, feel free to plop any thoughts, feedback, like personal stories in the chat. Um, we can read them for you guys too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know like one thing that came to mind when we were on the one of the first slides about like you are your brand. I feel like that is so evident when you're in an in-person selling market experience because I always feel like, you know, observing um, the vendors, observing their sales tactics, the people that really are standing up and talking to the customer are the ones that are more, most successful. And it's because they're sharing who they are. They're sharing their personality. They're telling stories about the products they're selling. And then you create that emotional connection to the customer and they're going to buy. So I totally like relate to that even on a in-person at Boston Women's Market kind of point of view too. Totally agree with Kara. Um, I think we we create a lot of our our relationships with you guys, right? And, the, and you guys, like Erica, we have created a relationship with the, with with Erica that keeps coming back to our markets, and it's because of that personal. Um, you create an uh, uh, you show your personal branding, right? You show who you are, and that's super important. But uh, we do have a question. Um, it says, Erica, can you give a few examples of how you would tie your craft with your interests, values, and, and uh, interests, please? Like, take one thing and how you put that in with your work, if that makes sense. Yes, it, it does make sense for sure. Um, I think the best example I can give is, you know, when I say when I founded my brand, it was in 2014. But when I say I really started my business was 2018. And the reason that I talk about it in that sense is from 2014 to 2018, I had no brand identity. I was like, I'm a painter and I will paint anything. I was literally trying to just cast my net wide. I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I wasn't really doing any of, the, any of these beginning steps. I was just saying, I like to paint and I guess I'm gonna sell my artwork. And I, you know, it was great. It was a great way to get started. Um, it led to a lot of word of mouth referrals, but it also, you know, it, it affected the work that I was getting to. I was getting a lot of projects that really didn't link back to my interests because I wasn't marketing to my interests, which were, you know, female empowerment and colorful vibrance and boldness and, you know, things like that. I wasn't really thinking about those things. I was just thinking about the end product. 
and feeling like I had to accept anything that came my way. And I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to this as a maker. You know, you see money and you're like, I want to do it. Like, I want to make it work. But if you're not enjoying the projects you're working on, it's not worth it. So in 2018, I actually had a friend challenge me and was like, hey, like, you know, I think your brand is really cool, but like, I don't really know what you're doing. Like, what are you doing? And I couldn't answer it. I couldn't answer it. I said, I'm just, I'm just selling my artwork. I would fumble. I didn't really have that tagline or that one sentence to describe my brand. And so I sat on it for a minute and I was like, what does light me up? And it truly only took me about 10 minutes to come up with it. And it was pretty reactionary, but it was true to how I felt, which was, I want to empower women. How I relate that to my artwork, I don't know yet, but like, I know that whatever I'm putting out there, that's the main theme I want to bring across through my brand. And that of course escalated into, you know, powerful statements and what I would want on my desk wall when I'm going into work or in, into my home office every day. Like, what do I wanna see that's gonna make me feel good and elicit that emotional reaction for my customers? So that would be the, example that you know that comes to mind right away and I feel like the second that I really started to focus on that it was easy for me to come up with a tagline it was easy for me to start thinking about different designs new artwork I could come up with because I always had that theme and I felt like I was almost my own target audience too I was like I want to be speaking to women like me what would I want to hear what what do I need to see what would I think was really unique that I would, you know, spend my hard earned money on? Um, let me know if that answers the question. If you want anything more specific, I'm happy to go into more detail, but I saw that you wrote that you still feel that way. Like I, I definitely still feel that way too. Um, it's really hard, especially, you know, it's hard when you're doing it as a side hustle and it's especially hard if it's your full-time gig, cause you're like, how can I turn down money if this is, you know, my income, but I, I want you guys to challenge yourselves to really think in this abundance mindset, which I know sounds a little woo woo, but really knowing that like the right work will come to you if you advertise yourself correctly and you focus on what you want to work on. If you start accepting things that you don't really want to work on, you won't have time or room or energy to take on those projects that are really going to fill your cup. So before you say yes to something, really think about why did this person come to me with this? Am I excited about it? Is this in line with who I am and what I want to do? And if not, is there something that I need to do to market myself or brand myself differently to better express and clarify the people I want to work with? And I'm just reading your comment back right now. I know it lights me up and what I stand for, but can't make the connection to my jewelry and marketing terms. I don't know how to come up with content related to both. Um, Tracy, I don't know if you feel comfortable, but would you want to explain that a little bit more? Because I'm sure that there's others that are struggling with this too. And that'll also help me just get a little bit more information to help give you some advice on that. Can you hear me? I can. I'm not turning my camera on. Oh, that's fine. You don't have to. Don't even worry. No worries. No worries. Uh, but so like I stand for, like my, my mission is to encourage self-acceptance, not necessarily self-love, because I feel like that's, I, let's start with self-acceptance and happiness. Yeah. But when I'm trying to create content, I don't know how it, I can get it. I don't know what to put out there that someone's going to be like, I want to buy that jewelry because that's what I think of. Like, you, does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Totally like, makes sense. I usually I think send out a Tuesday email every day and we just got back from vacation and I I sent out a, I'm sorry, I didn't send it out yesterday because I stared at my computer all day. And I just, I can't, it just doesn't come naturally to me. And, and I feel like the harder I try, the the worse, the bigger hole I did. You know, does that make sense? That totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. And I think one piece of advice I would give you is, you know, there's there's gotta be a story around why you created what you created. So in those moments where you're like, I have no idea how, like, I just want to share this, but I don't want to come across as salesy or ingenuine and just be like, Hey, buy my jewelry. It's really pretty. Right. Like, you're like, I want to really like connect with them. Like, think about why you created it. Like, what was your inspiration? Like, what, what's the story behind the piece? Cause I'm sure there's a reason beyond like, of course you think it's aesthetically beautiful and you love the material, but 
I can guarantee there's a reason, even if it's like a little bit more subconscious as to why you mm-hmm. created it mm-hmm. and created that specific piece. And I think sharing the story behind it, that is where you'll make that personal connection. Like okay. if a family or friend were to ask you about this, like, what was your inspiration for this? Or, you know, what, what occasions do you wear this for? Like really kind of taking it a level deeper and saying, why, why does this product exist? What's important about it? Why is it different from what I could get from like a Macy's or something beyond that it's made by a small maker? Like, is that sharing your process? You know, those moments in your studio where you're like, I'm ready to beat my head over the wall, like, Mm -hmm. but I'm exhausted, but like, I want to create this because X, Y, Z. And I think it's okay to share those, those moments of like, Hey guys, like, I am saying sorry because I didn't have anything to say, but sometimes I don't have anything to say because I'm human and I just want to share my products. Like people will appreciate that because that's okay. real. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know what? I would never even think to, to think that way. You know, like it, to me, it just makes more sense not to say anything, but I need to change that mindset. I think like even just like going, taking half an hour and going through your products and like, thinking about your inspiration behind them and your stories and just making notes on them. And I think you'll be like super shocked to see how many content ideas come out of that just from brainstorming and being like, why is this important to me? Like, why did I create this? And if it is just like the material or like the finish, like talk about that. Like, that's important. Where do you source it? Like people care about that stuff. You know, people don't Mm -hmm. care about that when they go into a big box store, but from a small business, they want to know it's important to them. Okay. Uh, could I chime in here with a personal anecdote about yeah, yeah. Tracy? Um, so <laughs> yeah. my my mom has been to several of Boss Women's Markets, and she actually owns quite a few pieces from Tracy because it. she loves them so much. And um, Tracy DM'd me mid last month or mid last year, and maybe in the fall, and she's like, "I was making this necklace, this pennant necklace, and I thought of your mom, and it would be perfect for your mom." Mm-hmm. Like sharing a story like that would be really lovely and personal because you are thinking about your valued customers when you are creating pieces and you're thinking about maybe their their personality when you met them or why does that piece remind you of this certain customer and Mm -hmm. how they inspired you to go down that road with the beads or the colors or the stones or okay something like that all right thank you yeah of course really 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 good questions um, before you. we go to the next section, does anyone have any other questions, comments, want to share any personal experiences on the topic? Okay, we will keep rolling. We'll have another question section shortly, so do not worry. Okay, so going into step two, identifying your competitors. So once you take this first step to figure out, you know, who am I? What do I stand for? The basics, really starting to focus on what industry do I want to be in? Am I creating jewelry? What are my interests? Am I creating artwork? You start to look at your competitors. Who else is selling in this space? What are they selling? What are they, who are they serving? What are they doing? What are their pricing? Um, to understand where you're going to fit in and how you're going to be unique and stand out, you really have to understand the whole sco- scope and market landscape. And when I say the whole scope and market landscape, I don't mean like all the artists on the call, go find every single artist in Boston. Like really once you start to figure out your niche, find those two to three people who you feel like you're admiring on Instagram and you're like, I want to do what they're doing. And I love what they're doing and like that's so cool and that feels really similar to me like who are those two to three people how are they doing what they're doing and what are what are they selling and how are they pricing themselves um so another really great quote in order to differentiate yourself from your competition you need to know what perceptions they own in the minds of the existing audience why are people going to them as the experts So when you think about identifying your competitors, there are three key things to focus on. The who, the what, and the why. The who is obviously what is the brand? What do they stand for? What are they selling? The what? Um, What are they doing that's different? What is their niche or the reason that makes them stand out in your mind when you're starting to look at all those competitors? why Why are you really feeling connected to them? 
And most importantly, their why. Why are they doing what they're doing? What is their mission? <clears throat> what is their reason to be or the reason that they're trying to solve something for their consumers? And I have, again, each section will have these questions that you can ask yourself. So as you watch this back, maybe after tonight, feel free to write these questions down. I definitely encourage you to do this um, as a, almost like a little self-taught like worksheet. So I really, of these three, we want to focus on the why because that's what matters the most. Again, that relates back to that emotional tie. The who and the what, nearly not as important as this why. The why is your reason to be. What makes that brand unique? This is not something that can be replicated. And when I say that, you know, I, I do want to preface, like, I am not the only artist in Boston who is creating very vibrant and bold pieces of artwork. You know, it's, it, it, it's hard because sometimes you'll be at a market and someone's like, hey, you know, I, I bought this piece from you. It was this. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't me. I know exactly who made that, but it wasn't me. And, you know, those are the moments that are pretty eye-opening because you're like, you know, I know the style is the same, but, you know, what was I not doing enough to stand out with that piece to make it clear that it was my work? Um, and again, it goes back beyond just the final product of what they're buying, but like, what is the story behind that piece? Tracy, what we were just talking about, like, why is that memorable? Um, so that's really important to look at when you're starting to do this deep dive on your competitors on Instagram or going into markets and taking note of who's there, like really think about not only what they're selling and what their booth looks like, but why are they doing what they're doing? Is it obvious to you? Um, so again, going back to our Apple example, Apple's why. So their main competitors are, their, are Nokia, BlackBerry, Motorola, Sony at the time. And you'll notice now we're in 2023 how many of these brands even really exist anymore. Um, I know this is like a very stark example. This is one of the biggest brands that exist in our world, but Nokia, BlackBerry, Motorola, Sony, those are all small names now compared to Apple. All of these brands existed before, but Apple came in and made such a unique splash with their reason to be and was so innovative that it made all these brands not matter as much. Their what is cell phones. That's their industry. That's their focus. And their why is we make great computers. They're user-friendly, beautifully designed, and easy to use, want to buy one. So they weren't thinking about their phones as phones. They were thinking about it in terms of a computer. They were trying to create a category of one where everyone was like, how do we make this phone look and sound and function differently? They were like, computers have all this technology. How do we make a computer that's more compact? So it's really just flipping the script and looking at things a little bit differently um, and almost flipping it, flipping it on its head to see that different perspective and sharing that with customers. Oh, I did not put a question slide here, but before we go into the next section, I will pause quickly. This one was short. Questions, questions. Okay. I will keep going. So identifying your audience. In order to create a meaningful brand with unique products and services, you must understand who you're selling to. What do they care about? What are their pain points? Why are they looking for artwork? Why are they looking for jewelry? Are they just shopping to shop? They like to spend? Or are they looking for something with a story? You're ultimately looking to reach people who like and share your brand's why. So read that again. You are ultimately looking to reach people who like and share your brand's why. I specifically didn't say people who are looking to buy your product. They are looking to connect with someone. Everyone is looking to connect with someone, even in their purchases. If they can make that emotional connection, if they can feel understood, if they can feel welcomed into your community, into your products, then they're going to want to buy. And this is really the key to having loyal consumers that come back instead of someone who's just buying it for a one-time purpose. If they connect with your why, they're going to follow you on Instagram. They're going to listen to your story. They're going to reach out to you with questions because they feel comfortable. They're going to 
think of your brand top of mind around the holidays when they're like, I want to create a custom gift for my mom. These are not the people who are coming to your market and they happen to walk by and they're like, that's really pretty. I'm going to buy it. Those are great too. But the goal obviously for creating a cohesive brand is having a cohesive following of people who really believe in your why and believe in your products, who are going to continue to put their time and your mon their money into your brand. Um, and my, this is my personal opinion, but I feel that it's better to be too niche than too broad. When you're too broad, you can get lost in the shuffle. Um, again, it's kind of like this Etsy effect where you buy something and someone's like, oh, where'd you get that? And you're like, I got it on Etsy. And it's like, well, Etsy is the website, but like, where did you get it from? And I'm completely guilty of this too. And I hate to say that because I'm a maker and I slap myself on the wrist every time I do it. And I've been trying to really like follow the brands that I'm buying from so that I remember and I know I can come back to them when I need something again. But that Etsy effect of like, I could go on Etsy and find a million brands who do engraving on wine bottles. Why is this brand different? Um, and, and I, you know, this is a side note, but this is why it's important to have your own website when you're ready or your own platform or your Instagram somewhere where you can brand yourself. Um, because a place like Etsy, while well, it's really great to get your brand out there and everything, and I have an Etsy store as well, it's where I started. It's really hard to create your brand reason to be on there um, beyond just adding your logo and a quick description. You really want a place where you can tell your story and sell your products. Um, so just a little side note there. Um, and then, you know, just noting everyone is not your customer. This was advice I had to take myself when I was trying to cast my net too wide and trying to just reach everybody when I was really not reaching anyone I really wanted to, the projects I really wanted to work with. My customers were lovely, but I was like, this isn't the stuff that really gets me excited to get out of bed. So identifying your, op your audience, these are three key things to think about, their needs, their desires, and their pain points, their needs. So I'll use my business as my example. So someone coming to me, maybe an art collector, might just be looking for one single piece for their kitchen, but they need something to fill their space, to brighten up their home environment, or to gift to a friend. Their desires, they're looking to find something that is unique, something that they're willing to spend money on and frame and hang up in their home for several years or to gift someone as for a special occasion, something custom, something unique. Their pain points might be that they can't find anything that really stands out to them. Everything is kind of a sea of sameness. Um, everything is too expensive or out of their budget or maybe on the opposite side, nothing feels luxurious enough for what they're going for. It might feel too cheap or too chintzy for their personal style. And again, all of these will differ depending on what your brand is and who your target is, but all three of these things will play into whether they'll buy from you once, whether they'll buy from you at all, and whether they'll continue to be loyal to you. But all of these ladder up into their why. Why are they looking for this item? And ultimately their why should match your why, that emotional tie back to the brand. So a few key questions to ask yourself, who am I trying to reach? Who do I feel like my products will connect with? For me, obviously, you know, bold, bright, female inspired. Um, I'm really trying to motivate young women who, you know, and women my age who are 30s, 40s, um, who just kind of need that boost of confidence or just want to like feel empowered and spread that like badassness into their homes or their friends' homes. Why do they care? Because they share that mission of female empowerment with me. They want to uplift other women. They want to uplift themselves. They want to make others feel good. They want to bring kindness and positivity and empowerment to their world and their friends. What are their needs? They might you know, just need a boost of confidence. They might just, they might be the most confident person. They just want that reminder on their wall to make them feel good every day. Those needs can differ from person to person. What are their desires? Their desires are to make a positive change across women or for themselves as a woman. And what are their unsolved pain points? This could be, you know, dealing with things from the past. Like I know for me personally, when I was in the corporate world, I dealt with a lot of, you know, 
misogyny and you know, I'm not going to go into it too much, but just dealing with feeling like I was not looked at as strong because I was a woman. And that is a lot of why I create the artwork that I create, because I'm sure there's others going through that. And I want them to know, like, you are a badass and you don't need someone at work to remind you of that. You need to know that yourself. So what are those emotional stories or experiences that they have had? And is there anything you can share from your personal experience through your artwork or through what you're making that will connect with them? Um, on a deeper level, when you're thinking about your audience is to go into your demographics. So beyond just the emotional, their needs, desires, their wants, their whys, who are you actually targeting? Where do they live? Where are they shopping? What platforms are they using? You know, millennials to Gen Z is very different. Millennials mostly on Instagram and Pinterest. Gen Zs, they're really on TikTok. Some YouTubers, like they're on Reddit. The platforms are different. So depending on who you're targeting might change what platforms you focus your marketing on. Um, same with your gender. Um, I know gender is a pretty hot topic. Um, this is something I know I've personally struggled with with my brand. Obviously, you've heard me talk a lot about female empowerment, um, but I'm really trying to focus on how can I be more all-inclusive, that everyone is welcome. It doesn't matter if you're a woman, I just want to empower your inner badass. So this is actually something, um, the word woman I've removed from my tagline um, to really just be all-encompassing because if someone doesn't identify as that, but they identify as my, with my brand, I don't want them to feel like they can't come to me for questions or have my, my support. Um, so that's something that's obviously just a very sensitive thing, but something to keep in mind as you're building out your target audience. Um, your the age will also have an impact on their like household income and their spend. Um, I know for me when I when I do pop up at like a downtown market like at like Copley versus when I pop up with the Boston Women's Market, the people who are coming are very different. The products I sell will be very different. If I'm in more of a downtown arena, I'm getting a lot of college kids who are willing to buy stickers and magnets for under ten dollars. Whereas at the Boston Women's Market, they're looking for pieces that they could gift as like permanent safe statement pieces in their home or at their friends' homes. They're looking for prints. They're looking for bigger products. They might even buy a couple. Um, so those are things to think about, you know, just having that span of pricing that will match what the age, gender, and household income is of your audience. And even tailoring that from market to market or in, from sales channel to sales channel if you're selling online. Um, one thing that I definitely recommend is creating consumer personas, and I'll show you an example, but this would just be a fictional representation of your ideal consumer. So for example, Kara is my target audience. I'm going to have a photo of her. I'm going to say what her age, gender, demographic, what her needs and her pain points are, and just have one liner statements for each thing and then making those connection points too. And this is why she would buy my work. And this is why she would buy my work. It'll just serve as that point when you're feeling lost in those moments where you're like, who am I even talking to? Like, who's buying my stuff? Like, who is this fictional person that just bought on my online shop? How do I learn from this sale? Those are the things that you can reference back and really compare and say, does this, map, this sale match up with who I thought I was actually selling to? So this is just a visual example, and you can absolutely Google some examples for yourself as well. Um, so this is called a consumer persona. So you've got, you create a fictional name, all of the demographics and details for this person. But the real key thing to focus on is the about who is this person and their habits, what's important to them, where are they hanging out, where are they shopping? Um, what are their traits? Like what, what are, are they going to be one of those shoppers who just buys in the moment, or are they going to want to do a lap around the market, really talk to and listen to people? Um, doing this exercise multiple times a year, I think is important too, because I think every event and market you do, you'll learn more and get a little bit closer to your audience. So I think it's always important to just continue to update this as you go and as you tweak your business. Pausing, that was a big section, a very, very important one. So I'm going to take a minute or so, let you guys 
ask any questions you've got. Kara, Africa, if you have anything to add, please feel free I, as well. I have a question. When you're yeah. looking at your different demographics, I know like I've definitely worked for businesses where they think, oh, this is my demographic. It's this person between this age and this age, and this is what they like. And then I'll pull up data and I'll be like, well, actually your data isn't saying that. They're point painting like a completely different picture about who your followers are and who's going to your website and that sort of thing. Can you pinpoint any kind of like resources of data that people should be paying attention to to help gather this information? Because sure, you can, you're going to meet tons of people and talk to tons of people at markets, but there are so many other <coughs> platforms that people can interact with you and that build that audience for you. So just wondering Definitely. if there are key areas that people should be looking at. Yeah, for sure. So I would say focus on whichever, whatever main platform you're on digitally, like online. Um, for me, that's Instagram. I use the Instagram insights tab all of the time. If you have a business account on Instagram, you have access to it. Um, and if after this call, you're like, I have no idea how to find that, DM me, I can send you a screen share of it. Um, but it'll tell you week to week and you can break it down week to week or over the last two days or the, over the last 30 days, over the last year, how many, what's your split between men and women? Uh, where in the world are people finding you? So like, I always find it really interesting that like, there's like 10% of my market that's in India. I'm like, wow, I've never actually targeted Indian consumers. Like, how are they finding me in India? I, I thought I was only in the US. So it's these really unique things that you get to see and seeing that data is pretty surprising. Um, the other interesting thing that I wanna note um, is that your audience online might be very different from your audience in person. So I know when I go on my insights for Instagram, 90 to 95% of my followers, those I'm reaching, those I'm engaging with are women. When I'm in person, it is almost 50-50, believe it or not. Um, I have a lot of beer forward artwork. And even if they're not buying the beer forward artwork, they might be purchasing one of the more female inspired pieces for their wife, their girlfriend, their mom. So that's something to really keep in mind when you're at a market. I would definitely encourage you, especially if you're starting out every market, take 15 minutes after the market to like, or if you have the time during it, take notes on those demographics of who is actually coming to your booth. You know, are you a female forward brand, but like men are coming to stop and ask about your brand. If so, that's really interesting. Like, is there something you can tap into there? What do you think is catching their eye? And feel free to ask them too. I think that's like one of the coolest parts of in-person events and markets is what piece is speaking to you? Like, what, you know, um, what do you like best? What do you like about it? Ask them. It's like free consumer research. Whereas on the computer, like you have more of those hard stats, which is awesome. And you can use that to drive what you're creating and who you're targeting, but you don't always have that opportunity to have that rapport and that conversation. So if you're in person, take advantage of that because I think it will be really eye-opening. And when you ask people questions, they offer a lot more information than you'd expect. Um, or they'll give you ideas of, hey, like, I really like this, but what if you tried doing this? Um, I know for me, one of the most eye-opening things recently, going back to the topic of gender is I was at one of the Boston Women's Market events and I had a 10-year-old come up and um, they were talking to me and sharing what they liked. And they said, you know, I really like that you have the future as female, but I actually don't identify as a female. You know, would you ever consider doing the future as equal or having more, you know, all encompassing work? And I was like, wow, that was really eye opening. I didn't even realize I was being closed minded to some people. Um, and that was something I learned from just having a conversation with a customer, a young customer, nonetheless. So I definitely encourage that. I think you'll learn a lot. That's great. And we have one comment from Samantha who says, um, sometimes I feel like I want to target uh, my target audience to be a certain clientele, but I end up getting customers that don't really fit what I thought my audience is. That so I wonder, happens. yeah, I wonder if that goes back to the ideation stage then, maybe yeah. reevaluating your ideation to get those target audience customers that you feel you would like right and this could go one of two ways like if you 
if you were really excited by the audience you thought you were targeting, say you were like, hey, I'm targeting 25 year old males. And you were like, I can't wait to work with this audience. And then you're getting 40 year old females and you're like, well, this isn't really what I envisioned. I don't feel as excited. Instead of continuing to make what you're making that is like connecting with them, go back a step and say, what are the pain points, the needs, the desires, the interests of the 25 year old males that I thought I was targeting? Because I still want to be there. So how do I connect with them? And what am I missing? What's not clicking with them? Is it my offer? Is it what I, am I not telling enough of my story? Um, or you can flip it and say, actually, this was unexpected. I really love what I'm making. It was unexpected that I'm reaching this different audience, but now that I know I'm going to talk to them in a different way and really lean into them. Any other questions before we hit the next step? Oh yeah, of course. Okay, I will keep rolling because I know we are approaching 7.30. So defining your purpose. This is really where everything comes to a head. I would say arguably the most important step, step number four, defining your purpose. So if you remember, your idea was made up of passions, values, and interests. But from your idea stem, stems your reason to be. So your reason to be, your brand purpose is really putting all of that together to be like, what is my one line or what am I doing here? If someone asked me what I do and what my brand is, how do I answer? Like truly challenge yourself because like I struggled with this for so long, guys. Like I, I would stumble over my words and I'd felt like I had to like prove something to anyone who was asking. And I'm like, no, I swear I'm a real business and I just don't know how to explain it well. But like that one sentence is something you can spew out conversationally. It's something you can put on your marketing materials. It's something that you can put in your Instagram bio. It can be the thing right when someone goes to their website, your website, they see it and they're like, wow, I connect with that. That's what I need. That's what I want. It is so powerful and it's really, really simple to put together. I, I'm, I'm actually going to break it down for you guys too. And I definitely encourage you to do this as an exercise for yourself um, after this. And I, I would say like, try it a couple of times too, to, to really pair these together to create that reason to be that, that tagline. So key questions to ask yourself, what am I on this earth to do? What is my personal purpose? And how does my brand purpose relate to that? What is my life or my business mission? These are deep, deep, deep questions. This is really where it all comes together. What makes my brand different? Okay, great. You sell soaps. What makes your soaps different? How do your soaps contribute and make your, your client's life better? I know it sounds like really deep and really silly and you're like, I'm just selling really delicious smelling candles, but it is deeper. And I like really, really challenge yourself to be like, is it something nostalgic as to why I created these scents? Does it remind me of a memory? Does it remind me of a moment? Is it a feeling? That those things are really important in the way that you'll talk about your brand and how you'll make those connections. The answer to these questions will help you again define those features and benefits of your product and service and really help to get those more logistical things on your website when you're building out your product library and your listings. So to define your purpose, you ground yourself in your what and your why. What am I offering and why is it important? Why does it connect with what I do? Step two, make a list of 10 adjectives that describe your brand's character. For this step, I encourage you to do this for yourself. I also encourage you to ask 15 or 20 people you know who know you or know your brand. It could be customers, it could be family, it could be friends. How would they describe you? How would they describe your brand? I truly did this exercise right when I was trying to niche down in 2018, when I really feel like my business started. And I have a note still in my phone of what everyone said. And you will be so shocked how many similarities in the words that people use will show up. You'll have 10 people use one single word. 
another nine people use another word. And those three words that those top three words, they will be commonalities between how others describe and perceive your brand. And then you think on that and say, is this how I want to be perceived? If so, okay, I'm going to lean into this, or this is not what I thought I was presenting to the world. What changes do I need to make to get to back to where I need to be? And then from there, you're going to use these words to pair with your what and your why to create your mission statement, your reason to be, that one liner that says who you are and what you do. This will be your purpose or your why, your audience, who are you targeting, and your offer. So all these things probably look super familiar. They've all been building on each other. Your purpose and your why is what we talked about in that first step, the ideation. Your audience is really that outcome of looking at your competition and your target consumer. And your offering is your purpose. What are you, what are you doing? Why is it important? So again, I'll go back to my brand as the example. So this is my personal tagline. And one, Funny thing to note that I was just telling Kara before we started was I actually, I did this presentation with Boston Women's Market a year ago. My tagline has changed since then. And I'll explain a few reasons why, but the reason that I'm bringing this up is to remind you that your brand is never fully baked. As the brand owner, you always have the ability to make changes, to tweak, to make it better, to get more specific. You might start and it might be a little bit more broad than you want, but as you go, you will niche down. I have changed the statement so many times. It's always saying the same thing, but it's getting clearer and clearer every time I do it. So if you're feeling stuck on this step, just keep working on it. Keep looking at it. When you're describing it to people, see how they react. Are they confused? Does it make sense? Are they nodding their head? Does it make sense to you? But take the time to really keep iterating on this and don't feel like it's a one and done. So my personal brand statement, the Blank Canvas Co. is a creative studio that specializes in custom art, brand strategy and design, and handmade statement pieces that empower your inner badass. So the purpose or the why that goes back to that initial, like, what am I doing here? That ideation. I, what's important to me is empowering others. My audience, women, and your in, in inner badass. So one of the changes I made to this is it used to say empowering women. So I talked a little bit about the gender, but the reason I took that out was to really be more all-encompassing, more inclusive. Um, I know that I mainly, my, my main audience is women, but I've decided to remove gender from my tagline in an effort to make everyone feel inclusive. So that's something you can play with. And obviously that's at a, a different comfort level for every person. And then my offering, what I'm actually delivering my product or my service is custom art, brand strategy and design and handmade statement pieces. These are really the three things that make up my brand. My custom art pieces, my brand strategy and design support for small businesses and handmade statement pieces, which are my prints, my stickers, my magnets questions. I'm going to keep this up just because I think seeing the tagline broken down is helpful. And if you guys are taking notes, I want to make sure you have each of those three pieces as you start to do this exercise for yourself. But I feel like this step is super important. So before we go into all the visuals and the fun stuff, which we'll kind of zoom through, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I'll just say if we're waiting for any questions too, Erica, don't feel rushed. Like Totally understand if people need to drop off, they need to yeah. get dinner if you're starving or anything like that. But Erica, don't feel too rushed to, you know, it's a, it's going great so far. I'm, I mean, I know personally, I'm reflecting a lot about <laughs> <laughs> different things with Boston Women's Market, so. Totally, totally. That's like the fun part of like doing the branding for yourself is like, you can always make changes genuinely like, that's that's like the blessing of having full control over your business and um, just being able to iterate and make, make changes. I'm just looking at the questions. It's an awesome reminder that your brand evolves over time. The building blocks stay the same, but you keep honing in on your craft as you discover more about your brand. Exactly. And thanks, Nikki. I'm so glad. Yeah, it really, you know, you learn so much from conversations with people 
Um, sometimes it's really, really, really hard to look at your brand strategically when it's your own brand. Um, you sometimes just need outside opinions of people who know you or are close with you will be honest with you just to give you another perspective, not to put you on a completely different path, but just to be like, is this clear? Am I, you know, am I really getting the point across that I thought I was, or is this really confusing? I always think it's great to have one or two people to go to, to lean on before you do a product launch or before you, you know, put your new website up to say, is there anything that's missing? Because people can poke holes in it um, better than you can do for yourself sometimes because you're very close to it. Okay, if there's no other questions, I will keep going. We're on to the fun stuff, guys. The creative visual identity. This is logos, colors, slogan, all of the fun stuff, all of the visuals. Um, this is my bread and butter, what I thrive in, what I love to see. I am totally one of those people who is guilty of going into the liquor store and purchasing a bottle of wine because of the branding. Um, and then later to find out it wasn't a great product, but I connect with the logo and the branding. Um, so what makes up your visual identity? The business name, your slogan, your logo, your business cards, your color palettes, your typography and fonts, and your imagery on your website, on your Instagram, those colors that come out in your photos. When all of it is put together and balanced in perfect harmony, it gives birth to successful brand identity. So this is really that key last component that solidifies your brand. And now having got to this step and going through all the previous steps, I'm sure you guys can now see a little bit better why it is so important to have that definition of what is the basis, what are my bones, what are my roots of my business before you can even say, I know I want to be this color or I know that I want my font to be script. It's like, well, you have to really have those emotional pieces intact before you can do this. And it makes this step far easier once you have those as well. So let's break each of these down. So your business name, um, I'm sure many of you already have one, um, but for those of you who don't or who are thinking about creating a business, I always recommend one to three words, simple and straightforward. Um, I know that I found with my business, the blank canvas co, um, often at markets, people will say the black canvas co, and they'll just, their eyes will kind of correct it. And I started to realize I'm not really making that connection point with them as to why I named my business this. So something I would just have you guys keep in mind as you're coming up with a business name is if there is some meaning behind why you're choosing it, if it's not as straightforward as like beautiful candles, you know, if there's something to it, make sure you explain that in your marketing, explain that on your stories, explain that at your markets, explain it on your website. Uh, this is something I literally just started doing. I've been doing markets for almost six years and I just really realized that this was a miss on my end. Um, so always just tune into those conversations. Are people remembering your name? Um, and if they're not, tell the story a little bit more. Your slogan, that's going to be your tagline, your cheeky phrase, what we just talked about. So a short and memorable phrase that captures your brand spirits and your values. This is something that you could put in your LinkedIn bio, um, just a quick informational, almost like a shortened version of your tagline of what you do and why. Your logo, how you visually define your brand. This is the first thing your audience will see besides your face, of course. Um, a clean, nice, uh, cohesive logo. I really feel like helps to tie a brand together. It's kind of like the, the um, bow on top of the present. Um, it just makes you feel and look more professional to your audience. If you have a really great brand and brand mission and great like energy and all that, that is the most important. But if you could top it off with a logo that really embodies that spirit visually, it makes such a key difference and it's memorable. Your color palette. So shades that you use on your brand assets, things to think about with this are going back to that emotional piece. I know for me, when I build out any brand color palettes for any of my clients, I really go back to the sentiment. So I'll give an example. I recently worked with an artist, um, Bodhi Dog Art Studio. All of her work was landscape forward and all of her um, designs were really inspired by hikes with her dog. 
that were meant to create this sentiment around this relaxing vibe and taking a moment to take a breath. And so for me, I was like, well, how does that translate into color? I think of cool colors, what makes you feel relaxed, what makes you feel meditative. That's how we really narrowed down what those colors were. If you're looking for something more loud and bold, you're going to lean into like those primary colors, the bright yellows, the bright pinks. So really that emotional word and that sentiment you're trying to create plays heavily into your color palette. Same with your typography, otherwise known as your fonts or your textiles. Um, this could be modern, traditional, retro. And then of course your imagery. I cannot stress how important it is to have professional photos of yourself and your products. That doesn't mean you have to spend a couple hundred dollars with a photographer if it's not in your budget. There are definitely workarounds, um, little tweaks and products you can find on Amazon to take these products yourself. Uh, I definitely started out by doing everything on my iPhone. And I think iPhones are the photo, the camera quality nowadays is actually pretty darn good. So you don't need a professional camera. If you have one, of course, it's awesome. Um, but do what you can within your budget, but there are definitely creative ways to make your products look really, really high end. And if you ever have questions or need tips on that, you can DM me, I got you, no worries. So just a quick example of a brand you guys already know, of course, McDonald's. They are loud. These colors, yellow and red, they elicit hunger, they elicit vibrancy, they want to be bold and seen when you're driving on the highway. They're not muted, they're not pastel. They're trying to be in your face and say, hey, you, you hungry on the side of the road? Come stop by and grab some food. But it's also very cohesive. The fonts are very bold and easy to read. Um, it really leans into their target audience. It shows visuals and it's fun and light with you know the items and the socks and stuff. It really, that even the M, it's very like kid-like. It brings you back to that nostalgic my mom just decided that she wants us to get fast food for dinner. And you're like, yes, like it brings you back to that feeling. Um, but it's also really cohesive and clean and um, uh, pretty like nice across the board and consistent. Questions. This section I could talk about and do its own workshop on. Um, so if you have questions about your own individual brand for this, you are always welcome to shoot me an email or DM. I'm happy to help. Maybe we should do a workshop just on this section. And we probably <laughs> should. It's a, it's a big one. Should. It's an important one for sure. <laughs> Tracy, I saw you said you buy so many skincare products for the packaging. I totally am with you. Same with like vitamins, like some of the the really sexy, cool vitamin packaging and brands, you know, I read on after and they're like, yeah, these don't really do anything for you. So it is crazy how much branding can affect your in-store or at market purchases. But when you can have something that's quality and really beautiful, that's obviously the goal. Um, yeah, if it looks I also, cool, it's same. I also want to just uh, say in relation to product photography, I know this is a, something that a lot of small businesses struggle with, you know, how to do that at home. We do have um, like a tips and tricks uh, blog post on our section of the website called the notebook in the notebook section of our website and um, a jewelry maker in our community, Olin Clayco, she did a whole tips and tricks for at home photography. So it's based around jewelry photography, but it definitely can be translated to candles, soap, skin products, uh, that sort of thing. So I'd be happy to put that link into the email I'll send around with the recording also. That's great. That's awesome. And just a couple of quick like tips and tricks for product photos that come to mind for me, like just depending on what you're selling, putting, taking photos of it in its environment. So not just having standalone photos of your candles, for example, but where would people actually put the candles in their home? Taking pictures of the candle on your coffee table next to a bouquet of flowers, uh, really making it look realistic. I know for me, for my market booths, like I used to just up until this year, really only had my prints in bins that people could scroll through. I didn't have like a true gallery wall or something that people could step back and be like, oh, I can see that on my wall. Like, you know, the ideal is for me to have a bar cart in my 
in my booth where above it, I have all my bar cart art and I'm like, hey, look how great this would look in your home with all your alcohol lined up. So really just starting to put your products in their natural environment because you'd be surprised how, how hard it is sometimes for customers to really envision what it would look like, feel like, smell like in their home. So really try to capture that with your photography along with those standalone photos as well. Yeah, I love that. That's a great point. Oh, thanks, Christina. I'm so glad. We had into awesome. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. And this last, last section is super, super quick too. And then I can open up the floor and answer some of the questions um, that we got before um, we started as well. But yeah, feel free to stop me at any point. I have the chat up, so I see it coming through. Um, so the last step, step six in your branding steps is to market your story. So at this point, you know who you are, you know why you're here, you know what you look like and what you wanna be to the world. Now you gotta tell people about yourself. You have to make yourself known. You have to make yourself heard. You have to show your customers where you are. This is a really key step because you could have this amazing hidden gem, but if no one's seeing it, then it's a lost cause. So knowing where, and this goes back to really knowing your consumers and where they show up, this is where you start to lean into that. So if you're like, my consumer is a 28 year old female, she's a millennial and she works a full-time job. Well, guess what? She's probably not on social media during the day, pretty much. She's probably logging off, getting dinner, doing her workout, jumping back on. And she's probably scrolling through Pinterest, maybe looking at TikTok videos to get inspiration for a meal she's gonna cook that week or a workout she wants to do at home. Those are the things you gotta start to lean into to be like, where are these people shopping, looking, scrolling? They might not even specifically be on a platform to buy. Like for me, I know I scroll through Pinterest every day. My intention is never to be looking on that platform to buy, but I started a folder for myself that says products that I need to get for myself because I'm like, wow, I didn't realize people were selling stuff on here. I want to make sure I can find this for when my mom's like, hey, what do you want for your birthday? Um, so even if it's not a selling platform, keep sales top of mind for that customer base. And remember those details of your audience, their likes, their dislikes, their motivation. So not only where they are, but what's important to them. And draw, your, draw attention to yourself on various channels. This goes back to that conversation we had about how your audience can be so different online versus in person. I think it's really important to focus on at least two different platforms that you can. Do not feel like you need to do everything all at once. Like, I mean that, that's more important. I'd rather you focus on one than try to focus on 10. Um, it's just too much. You don't need to be on all of them. Really try to niche down, figure out where your customers are, where you feel excited to show up. If you feel stressed about TikTok and you're like, video is not my thing, get off. If you're not going to feel excited and passionate about it, your content is probably not, is probably going to come across the same way. Go where you feel excited and go where your customers are and start small and build. Same with like your website. If you're starting a website, don't feel like you have to have your website linking to your Pinterest and have your Pinterest ready and your Instagram. You have all that like amazing. Like it's a lot of work though. Just tackle one thing at once. Do not try to do it all. Um, and now that you've built your brand again, it's time to actually show it to the world. So a couple key questions to ask yourself. What social platforms do my target audience, does my target audience use? Where do they shop? Where do they learn? Where do they read? Where do they hang out in person? For me, I'm starting to look into workshops. I'm like, where would people go for a workshop? Where is convenient for them? What is the right price? What kind of topics or designs should I paint that really connects back to this target audience? Why would they pay $60 to paint with me if they're, what they're painting is not something they'd ever hang up? So it's really starting to think through that consumer journey. So what are those top three to six platforms, places um, where, you're, where the, you can position your offer in front of that target audience and they'll be excited and want to buy in? So a couple platforms to look at, keep in mind, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Ecom, D2C, Wholesale. I mean, I could keep going beyond this slide and I can tell you from experience, I am not on even half of these. 
So do not stress. And I'm not the only example here. I know like from talking to many other brands, like doing all of this as a one woman show or a two person show is a lot. It's a lot of maintenance. It's a lot of logistics. So start small and build. Your brand will grow. Start on Instagram if that's where you feel comfortable. If you start to do reels and you're like, hey, I love this, move to TikTok. If you're like, hey, I really like showing my face on Instagram and TikTok, try YouTube. Try it and you can always say, hey, I don't love this, but keep your options open. And again, choose platforms where you feel like your customers are going to be. Before we move to key takeaways, questions on how to actually market yourself. This is another one where I could go on and on and on. And I think it's really personal depending on the brand too. Nobody. Okay. All right, we will go to key takeaways and we'll wrap up with some questions and I'll let you guys be on your way. Okay, key takeaways. No corporation or small business can survive without a differentiated brand. If this is something you want to pursue as a side hustle, as a full-time gig, make yourself stand out. Take the time to go through those first four steps. Really flush out who you are, why you are, what you want to be, who your competitors are, and how you're going to differentiate yourself. It is so important to the longevity of your brand. Two, connecting with the right target audience on an emotional level is the key to unlocking trust, loyalty, and long-lasting sales. Again, beautiful branding can get you that one-time purchase, but if you try the product after you buy that beautiful brand and you're like, hey, this skincare product really sucks, you're never going to go back. So how do you create that first impression that's a long-lasting impression that will lead to people keeping you top of mind, knowing what your brand is and not saying, hey, I got it on Etsy? Three, the details matter. Those details of your logo, what you look like, how it feels, if if you're an emotional brand that's bringing together this calm sensation with a candle, but your colors are screaming, bold, vibrance, something's not connecting. Think about those details. Make sure every step that you're putting out really links back to what you want to be and who you are. Step four, key takeaway four, take your time. This is a creative process and it is never done. Truly in the same way that our to do's as a brand and Small business and entrepreneur are never done. Neither is your creative process and your brand. I've already changed my logo two or three times since I started my business in 2014. And every time I've done it, I felt better and better and closer to who I am and what I am and more confident in what I'm bringing out in the world. So take your time, take those learning moments, write down notes. And when you have the time, go back and make those iterations, even if it's small things, and not everything all at once. Lastly, and most importantly, give yourself grace. You are only one person. Um, this has been the hardest lesson for me, um, especially if you're in a full-time job and you're used to things moving so quickly because you have a team. When you have your own business, it's very different. You're doing everything. In many cases, you're doing the finances, you're doing the making, you're doing the logistics, you're answering emails. So if someone's giving you sass because you didn't answer an email, instead of getting frustrated, take a second and just say, hey, I've been heads down and creating new things. I really want to be present and have new things available for my customers at the right time. And therefore, I'm taking a break from email. And you, you can say that, and that's okay. And like, give yourself that grace, not even just explaining it to others. Just remember that yourself and make sure you get sleep. Another thing I've learned the hard way, there's always things you're going to want to and have to do in your business. Take your time, give yourself grace, do what you got to do and crack along one thing at a time. Just chip away and lean on your community. I mean, lean on Boston Women's Market. They've done so much for me that, you know, it's just a good reminder of other people are going through it with you. Other people are on this journey. They might be at a different step, but there's always someone who understands because sometimes entrepreneurial life can be really lonely and confusing and people don't always get it when you're asking for advice if they're not going through it. So give yourself grace and lean on your community of fellow makers. They're the closest thing you got to coworkers. So yeah, and that's all I've got for you guys. I know we're over, but 
I wanna make sure you guys have a chance to ask any questions that you have. I'm gonna pull this over onto the screen and then um, Kara, I know we're over. Do you want me to go through some of those questions that were submitted? Yeah, let's hit one or two of them. I totally understand if people need to drop off. So just feel feel free to do so if you're like, I'm really tired or um, totally get it. We're just really appreciative that you're here tonight. And um, yeah, so Erica, why don't you just go ahead and do maybe one or two of them and then um, as Erica said, like you can always email us with additional questions too, and we'll make sure that we get there, get to Erica yeah. also. And I know like all three of us are really good about answering DMs. So if you feel more comfortable doing that and email is not your thing, if you're just got something that comes top of mind, just shoot it over to our inbox. We'll get back to you. Don't worry. I'm going to actually start with Nikki's question. So since you are so important to sell your brand and your items, how can we be better about showing ourselves mostly online just as much as you show your items? This is great and showing yourself is probably even more important than showing your items. Um, I'm actually working with an event planner right now and helping her with her marketing and social. And this is something I've been really trying to encourage her on is like, when you're showing yourself, you don't have to have makeup on. You don't have to be buttoned up. In fact, like it's okay to show yourself being like, hey guys, really stressed right now. Don't really have time to get on here. Just wanted to say hi. And I'm working on making a bunch of things, maybe give a sneak peek, but don't feel like you need to like turn on and record and re-record until it's perfect. Like, I think that's really the beauty of Instagram stories right now too, is that people are really leaning into just being off the cuff and being themselves and sharing and oversharing. If you ever need a good example of this, and I'll drop this in the chat, um, this is someone who I really look up to in this aspect. Did that send? Maybe. Hold on, let's see. Okay. Paige Lindsay Designs. She is a fellow artist. She used to be in Boston. She um, is in New Hampshire now. I'm sure some of you follow her. If you ever need a good example of someone just showing up and being themselves unapologetically and just motivating you to feel more comfortable yourself, this girl is incredible. She just gets on and talks very candidly. Nothing feels rehearsed. Uh, she'll get on and be like, hey, my hair is a hot mess. Just saying good morning. Just drop my coffee on myself. Like, You also don't have to always be sharing those you moments as it relates to your brand. Again, people care about you, not just you, the maker. So if your dog is sitting next to you while you're working on your painting, share a photo of that, share your dog, share your husband, share the meal that you cook. Like people really care and want to connect and relate to you. And if they can relate to you and what you're doing, they're going to be so much more excited about your brand. So I would say like my best advice, Nikki, is to just like, kind of like let it roll. Don't feel like it needs to be planned or buttoned up. Go on as you feel comfortable but definitely share those personal moments beyond just like a, hey, I'm the maker, I'm just reintroducing myself, like share stories, share moments. If you're traveling that weekend or you're on a trip in Canada and you see a beautiful mural that gave you a new idea for a design for your product branding or, or your, you know, a new sticker idea, share that. People want to see where the inspiration is coming from. Um, so I one, I love that. <laughs> One thing that I love that you do, Erica, and this is a way of you sharing who you are and your personality without actually putting yourself on video is sometimes you share those like, here's what I'm up to today. And they're like, just lists, like bullet point lists that you share on stories. And you're like, I'm going to go to Tate and get a latte. And then I'm going to core power yoga. And then I have a meeting, you know, with this person. And then, and then I'm working on this project with so-and-so. And you get like insight into a day in the life of Blank Canvas Co. And it's not like you're filming yourself talking. It's just like a bullet point list. And I think that I always love those. So I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Erica is like so motivated. I'm usually taking a nap at that time. And she's on her like 12th meeting of the day. <laughs> oh my gosh. I hate <laughs> meetings, guys. I'm going to be honest. I hate meetings. But Truly on days where I share that, it's because I don't have the mental capacity or time to show my face and I don't want to force it. Like 
the most yeah. important thing you can do is just be authentic for yourself. If you're having a shitty week and you feel like crap, do not show your face. Like, don't, not because we don't care what you look like, because you look like shit. Who cares what you look like? But like, if you are not feeling it, that will come across to your customers. If you're feeling it and you're super jazzed up, that will also come across. So on those days where you're like, I really want to share something and I feel like I haven't been on here in a while, but like, I don't have any new artwork to show or I don't have, there's nothing in the works. I'm just doing logistical business stuff. You can share that too. And that truly happens to me probably every other day because I'm running my business and I'm freelancing. So I'm often off of social during the day and writing for my other clients and I want to be present for them. And I want to be present in the work I'm doing. And that's often why I'm not on my email. And that's okay. Like you can share that with people and be like, hey, I'm off email this week. Today, this week is a creative week for me. I'm just doing my thing. And that's all they need to know. And other weeks you're like, let me share everything because there's new stuff coming and I'm so excited. But really go off of what you feel and don't push yourself to do anything that you're not wanting to do in that moment because you feel obligated because you see your competitor doing it. Do not do that. It will only lead to you feeling icky and it will be very obvious to your audience as well. Any other questions or comments on that topic? Anyone want to share any, any stories related to that or any feels about social? Because I know there's like so much pressure out there and like take the pressure off, take it off. It's no fun. Like you do not, that's that's what, again, it brings it back to you. You are unique. You are you. Just because your competitor is doing it does not mean you have to do it. Don't do anything you don't want to do. That's the fun part of creating your own brand. You don't have anyone to answer to except for yourself. We have uh, another question. It's about social media. So I don't know if we want to tackle this tonight, but but um, how important is it to get more likes and engagement on my IG posts? I get way more views on my stories than my posts. I feel stressed, frustrated that my posts are getting lost. Oh, girl, I feel you. Um, this is definitely part of the algorithm struggle. Um, I would say don't worry about likes. I think personally, I strongly feel that likes are just almost like the uh, the fake, I don't want to say fake proof, proof because people are liking it because they enjoy the content, but it's almost like the showboaty way to be like, see, there's so many people liking my content, but I will guarantee you there are a ton of people that you're reaching with your content that are seeing your content that are not liking it. Um, they're just scrolling and they're connecting with it and they're choosing to continue to look at your content and to go to your page but they might not be showing you through likes. So I feel like likes are sometimes a false representation of your the performance of your content. Instead, I would judge it based on like conversations. So are people responding to your stories and asking questions or being like, ha ha, or liking it or, you know, responding to your polls. I think those interactive moments, especially on stories are even more impactful, like putting, the heart sliders and the polls, because people have to choose to engage in that. For people to respond on a comment, on a post, like it, it feels like it's more work, whereas like a poll feels like kind of like a ga this gamification of interacting with your content, where they're watching it enough to read your poll and actually respond. The other thing I wanna note too is, again, Instagram, you only have so much control. 10% or less of the people following you are seeing your content, which is a really shitty stat, but it's really true. So you could be spending three hours creating the best reel of your life and maybe 300 people will see it. And it's super frustrating, but that's why, and I know Kara is going to jump for joy when I say this, I need to do this more practicing what I preach, but that is why something like email or your website is much more impactful because you own it. You own that algorithm. You own the output, the frequency, the audience you're targeting. It is your platform. There isn't something going on behind the scenes logistically that is changing the viewer. If they're on your email list, 100% of the people are getting it. Maybe only 50 are opening, but 50 is still better. 50% is still better than 10% on Instagram. And I am knocking Instagram because it's 
a really crappy thing about them, but I will also say Instagram is a really great way to grow your business. But when those moments happen, remember that it's probably not you. It really is just the algorithm, but continue to be consistent. That's the most important thing on Instagram is just being consistent. There's weeks where I will not post or do any reels in my in-feed, but I'll be active on stories just to like keep conversation going. So give whatever you have, but don't feel like you have to be posting every day, being on stories every day. Like again, do what feels right for you. And if one week you're really feeling it and one week you're like, I need to take a break, take that break too. But yeah, likes I would say are far less important than the engagement, which would be comments or DMs or conversations that are happening like person to person. Yeah, and I'll say, Juno, we have two really great um, webinars or workshops from last year on our YouTube channel about social media. And both of those webinars go more in depth into that concept and that philosophy too. So definitely recommend taking a look at those. All right, Erica, I think we're getting to our stopping point. I know we have some questions that people submitted um, but if you'd like, we can we can definitely connect you with those folks that submitted questions via the the registration. Yeah, that would be awesome. I want to make sure everyone gets answers. So if you wanna, um, I don't know, I doubt everyone who uh, submitted questions is on the call, but care you and I can connect on how the best way to get everyone all the info they need. And I'm sure your heads are spinning. This was a lot of information, so take it in take your time. If things come up over the next week, month, you have questions or you're like, hey, this was really helpful or hey, this was super confusing. Can you explain more? Please do not hesitate to reach out to us. That is why we're here. We want to help. Um, so just let us know and um, I'll end with where to find me. Um, it's been a pleasure being your host with the Boston Women's Market tonight. Um, I really thrive when I'm in another community, just community setting with other women-owned businesses. Um, so I definitely want to connect with the, all of you. I know I'm already connected to a few of you, but um, if you shoot me a DM on Instagram, send me your handles. I'd love to follow along and help wherever I can and just follow your journey and hopefully meet you at a market. But um, my Instagram is at the blank canvas co and my website is the blank canvas company.com website on email and all that is linked on my Instagram. So really all you need is the handle and you'll know where to find me. But um, I do offer brand and marketing services, content creation and social media assistance. So if there's anything you need, um, just shoot me an email, shoot me a DM. I'm here for you. And thank so it's Boston Market too. Thank you so much, Erica. And thank you so much for everyone for joining us tonight. And I hope everyone can join us for next one next month, April 5th. Um, so we'll see you all there. Thank Have you. Have a good night, guys. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.